This is Leslie Kane, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and I am joined for a guest making his third appearance on the podcast, former CIA analyst, experiencer, and, of course, most importantly, a previous guest on the podcast, like I say, uh, Mr. John Ramirez. John, welcome back. Uh, Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, I'm glad to be back. It's good to have you here, and you've been on a couple of shows recently, uh, making some waves with some opinion, some comment, some interesting theories. Uh, Most recently, I'll just say off the bat, uh, Chris Leto show on YouTube, The Leto Files. I thought there was a fascinating discussion with you looking at radar uh, systems and data. And I would point anyone who hasn't watched that yet to certainly go and check that one out because it's not your run-of-the-mill conversation, if you want to call them that, with John around his background and thoughts and opinions. So really enjoyed that one, John. A really well put together presentation as well. So thank you for that with with Chris. Um, Before we get started, John, like I say, it's your third time on the podcast, but there may be new listeners checking you out for the first time, and they might want to know a little bit of your background. Can you just summarize that for us? Uh, Certainly. Uh, Andy, I was a CIA officer uh, from 1984 to 2009. And during that period of time, I was in the Directorate of Science and Technology in the signals, signals Intelligence field. And of course, for your UK audience, they may know of GCHQ. So I did primarily what GCHQ does for the UK government in uh, collecting and analyzing signals. Also, I served in the Director of Intelligence in the Weapons Intelligence Analysis area specializing in ballistic missile defense, and that is the uh, study of missiles that can shoot down other missiles. So it's like anti-ballistic missiles. And uh, during that time, uh, which was in the offices where the legacy UFO program resided, that's when I first became exposed to UFO uh, issue at CIA. And I would preface that I was not read into any special programs. It was just a matter of having encountered instances of these objects being tracked by our adversary radars, uh, primarily uh, back in the day, the Soviet Union and later the Russian Federation. So their radars were tracking some objects like our radars, our radars track objects. And they were wondering uh, what they were. They thought it was us. Of course, when we track something like that, we think it's them. And later we find out it's neither of us or the Chinese. So that's primarily my background. It's uh, mostly in in technical intelligence, I would say. I was not a traditional, what you would consider a CIA spy in the sense that I didn't have to recruit uh, foreign nationals to spy on behalf of the U.S. So I didn't do any of that stuff that you see in the movies. What I did was mostly uh, behind the scenes in laboratories at CIA, working with my counterparts in GCHQ in the Ministry of Defense UK, as well as the Australian Signals Directorate. And and within the United States, of course, we have the National Security Agency and other parts of the Pentagon, um, which deal with a foreign weapon system. So that's primarily my background in a nutshell. Thanks for that, John. And I do suggest anyone who wants more of that in detail checks out the previous interviews with John. So anything you think may be missing has probably been covered previously. Let's get right into things anyway, John. 2023 has been a very interesting year. And as we record this, we're, we're getting into the middle of May and there's a lot of very recent conversation going on. I think it's important, though, you use the word preface, and I'm going to preface this interview with you by repeating something you've said to me before, that, that much of what you say as opinion and you're you're honest about that and that can sometimes be misconstrued as fact especially when things are put out in small snippets online you know a quick soundbite of what you say they miss out the first few sentences and all of a sudden John Ramirez confirms back engineering program happened you know and it's just it's just taken out of context um as it's fair to say though given your previous role many will look at your statements as some kind of informed opinion and do you understand where that comes from Yes, absolutely. Um, I would call it uh, informed opinion uh, based on fact and uh, informed speculation based on fact. And those facts are sourced from others who actually have these clearances to work on these programs. And so you've heard, for example, uh, Dr. Eric W. Davis saying that, yes, there 
have been crash retrievals. We have metamaterials uh, in our possession. We have the technology in our possession. And that's someone who is speaking from fact that he mm-hmm. had access to these materials. Uh, I never did, but I consider Dr. Davis to be a credible source. And so in many instances, I would reinforce what other people say. And so that's why it gets misconstrued, mis- uh, misconstrued as something I would like to, de- I am declaring. But uh, having said that, um, I am well informed and I do have NDAs, but none of those NDAs are directly related to the UAP UFO subject matter whatsoever. I never had access to them. When I had the opportunity to have access, I refused. I didn't want any knowledge of that. And you will wonder, well, gee whiz, I, w- I would definitely get that. But if I had that, you wouldn't be hearing from me now. And you would never know uh, who I was at all um, because I would be restrained from speaking about any part of it. But I knew enough to know that it is a genuine thing, that there are craft flown by non-human intelligence. And I think that is the very first step in the disclosure process, that we have to stop saying uh, there could be foreign adversaries, uh, we don't know what they are, um, so forth and so on, uh, all of the other reasons that we've heard for so long. Uh, and definitely they're not weather balloons. Um, hmm. So I would say, you know, first step is to disclose that non-human intelligences, non-human beings are involved with what we're seeing in our skies. You know, you've gone straight to my last question, but let's uh, let's run with us on the spot then. Let's make this a little bit ad hoc on my part and make it difficult for me. Um, so you've said that, that governments need to get away from that talk of adversarial technology and you feel that is happening. They need to come out and say non-human intelligence. It seems that's the logical next step. But is it fair to also say that's the biggest step of all for any government to totally break away from the vague, generic dancing around it and actually saying a word like alien or non-human or ET, whatever they want to use, but to say it's something else? How how do we get to that step? Well, getting to that step is very simple. It's just a matter of that's the first step to take that biggest leap, as you say, Andy, it it is truly a huge leap based on what governments have said before. But that is a huge leap. And in order to have a discussion of what's really important, uh, and to me, that is, why are they here? Why are they visiting this little planet, third from this obscure star that is nothing special in a very big galaxy and what is known as the Orion Spur of the Milky Way galaxy. Here we are, this planet that we know that our ancestors lived on. Why are they here? Why are they interacting with us? And this goes to the experiencers as well. Why are experiencers encountering them? Uh, Why are channelers receiving messages from them? That big why question, we can't even get there until we admit Um, this government, the United States, the UK government, uh, other governments in the world to admit that, yes, there's something else happening here that is not human, that's interacting with humans. And perhaps if we look back toward, uh, for example, religious texts, there's always like the encounters of humans with what the ancients called the divine. And uh, was the divine actually a manifestation of what we're seeing in our skies? It's just that uh, They didn't have the terms of reference. They didn't have the science uh, to think of them as um, beings from somewhere else other than the planet. So, yeah, that is a big first step. But um, I'm saying that that step will occur. That needs to occur or else all the other discussions are like moot. I mean, why even go there? It continue to be speculation unless we involve the non-human beings into that equation in order to solve or resolve um, the issue. And that's the whole purpose of Arrow. It's all domain resolution, all domain resolution office. Resolution meaning we need to figure out who they are, what they are, what are we dealing with? And Arrow has a long way to go, but I've stated before that you're not going to get any disclosure from Arrow in front of the United States Congress. That's not going to happen. That is not their purpose. They're actually looking at it from a aviation safety standpoint. 
Um, so aviation safety is very big for them because our pilots have encountered them. In fact, uh, was it not one of the F-18 pilots off the Nimitz who said, um, or that there were fleets of them? They're like, there's like a whole there's, bunch there's of them. There's a whole fleet of them, yeah. A whole fleet. And it may not be um, from the Nimitz. It may be from one of the other carriers. Um, but um, that statement was made by a naval aviator serving in the U.S. Navy, flying these planes and seeing them and describing them as fleets. Um, I don't think that our adversaries have fleets of these craft flying off the East Coast. And I believe this was seen off the East Coast of the United States over the Atlantic. Yeah, the, the adversaries fleets, don't have that. No, I think and, it was the fleet was the gimbal footage, wasn't it? Oh, but yes. Also, okay, thank but you. To, but to be fair, on, on the Nimitz case, the Princeton and the Nimitz tracked many, many objects. Many, it wasn't many just objects. One. They, they filmed right. one that we know of, but there right. were lots of them on radar, yeah. Right, yeah. I would love to see the rest. And again, mm. I, I have no clearances, or as we say in the U.S. government, the insider speak is, I have no tickets in order to see them. And that's a very w- good way of saying it because there's the show and I don't have the ticket to go see them. Um, other people do and other people have seen them and they're coming forward, I think, later on uh, this year. That's another statement I made uh, that's based on more informed um, opinion that uh, we're on the verge of at least the initial disclosure of saying that this is non-human craft that we're seeing. And so I think other people will start saying that. And in a very official way. Um, so I'm looking forward to that as well as, as with everyone else. I want to hear that statement first. Yeah, a, a bit of a hot button issue. And I've had this conversation with many people and it, it gets a little bit heated sometimes, but mm-hmm. I like heated, heated debate is always healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, um, everyone can be friends at the end of it. And including myself and Dan, who comes on the podcast often disagree on this. Mm-hmm. That, And I, I would love to know your take that, how do I word this? People who have really high security clearances or are privy to information that they are mm-hmm. not at liberty to disclose due to any yeah. sort of binding agreement. Correct. How often do those conversations still happen in a way? Because it seems there are a lot of people out there with a lot of knowledge that either weren't supposed to have that knowledge or they're speaking around it in, in relatively clever ways. Is it fair to say that just sometimes, even at the highest levels of US government, Human nature gets in the way and people talk. Well, I, I would say this. Um, first of all, we we in the United States and all over the world, we owe a debt of gratitude to the U.S. Congress for passing the legislation that allows this to happen. Now, it's true, Andy, that if we have exploited the technology, that is, we built something based on the metamaterials or some knowledge of the propulsion system that these craft use. If we have something, that is the United States government, particularly the U.S. Air Force, has something that can fly, maybe not travel through a um, wormhole or not travel through a portal, warp drive to another star system, but still something very extraordinary that can fly in our space um, nearby, uh, that will still be under wraps. Those non-disclosure agreements are still in effect because that's something that we built from something. And that is a military advantage to the United States and to our allies. We will not release that information, I don't think. So to, to your point and to the point of others who've stated that, absolutely right. We will not disclose anything that we have exploited from the source technology. Now, Source technology is the metamaterials that we may have gathered um, from crash retrievals, or I would dare say, you know, if the like, like bigger parts of a craft may have uh, been able to uh, be recovered, uh, that type of technology, uh, that's no longer under NDA because that's the source technology. And in fact, uh, if the original legislations c- called out non-human technology. The word non-human was actually used in a legislation of the United States of America for the first time, non-human. That was in there. So it separates what we have exploited from the actual technology that we may have collected. So the actual technology, in my opinion, belongs to humanity. It belongs to all of us. It should not belong to any particular sovereign government. 
it may have crashed in New Mexico in the United States, or it may have landed at Rendlesham Forest in the UK. Um, and, you know, that doesn't belong to the UK or the United States or any country. Um, we hear of um, James Fox ha- did a wonderful documentary about the um, Virginia crash in Brazil and um, the recovery of bodies. Now, does that belong to the Brazilian government? Did that belong to the United States? Allegedly, the United States came in and retrieved all of that. Um, I think it belongs to all of us. And we should know if we are being visited by uh, non-humans coming to the planet. I don't think the non-humans give it darn, actually, whether it's the UK or the United States or Canada or Australia or Russia or China. To them, it's just planet Earth. Mm. We're coming down to planet Earth. Um, And do they understand how we organize ourselves geopolitically? Maybe not. To us, we're like different nationalities and different belief systems, different cultures, different languages. To them, we're earthlings, one planet. And so they may not even distinguish um, that they're landing in the sovereign territory of the United States. They probably have no concept of, of a sovereign country on this planet. So that's why I think it belongs to all of humanity. And that's why I applaud the work of... San Marino, that little country in Italy, and their Project Titan, in mm. order to like um, move this forward uh, into the international arena under the umbrella of the United Nations, because I'm sure like countries would not want to give up anything um, unless it was under some international agreement. There's some memorandum of under- understanding or memorandum of agreement amongst all these countries to do so. And so I'm a strong proponent of doing that. And I hope that disclosure ultimately will lead to the United States getting out of this UFO monopoly that we've had uh, since uh, 1947, if not before uh, 1947. So it's a monopoly more so than a truth embargo. Truth embargo, I I can understand why people say truth embargo, but if there was a truth embargo, you wouldn't hear anything. Hmm. You would not hear a hint of anything, but you're hearing more than hints. And we got three videos. Um, so it's not really a truth embargo. I believe it's more of a the monopoly that we want to monopolize this technology because we did something fantastic with it. But what we did, the United States, when I say we, United States, they did something um, that has some kind of military capability. And so that's what they're protecting. Um, should they do that? I don't believe so. I believe we should eventually release the source technology to the United Nations and let civilian scientists work on it. Because in the government side, uh, it's so stovepipe and compartmented, these stovepipes. They, you may have a team working on metamaterials, and you may have another team working on metamaterials, and these two teams may have some inkling that there's another team. But when one team hits a roadblock and can't go anymore, they cannot collaborate with the other team who may have gone further. So mm-hmm. there's no cooperation even within um, the, pro- the programs um, to share information. It's so like stymied at that level. And I believe that's something that uh, Dr. Davis has stated himself, that once a team has reached the end of its knowledge and resources and can't go any further, they're out of luck. Um, they can't go and collaborate. But if we re- release that technology to civilian scientists and let civilian scientists do something with it other than build this fantastic spy plane that's shaped like a triangle, for example, uh, they may benefit um, from it by studying it and making that benefit shared with the rest of humanity. You know, there could be some way of, of actually solving the energy crisis of not using fossil fuels, for example, just an example. So that's what I'm proposing that, that we do. And that's what I would fight for after disclosure, that that's a very important step. And not only that, there's a consciousness aspect to all of this. Um, Without the consciousness aspect to this, um, we're just studying like nuts and bolts, you know, yeah, shaped like metamaterials. And what good is that? Okay, you know, know, fantastic. But there's a consciousness aspect to it. I believe the government is aware, the U.S. government is aware that there is a consciousness aspect to this phenomenon. Um, And that's why they went to Skinwalker, because some of that consciousness aspect manifests itself as itself as high strangeness. And what is that all about? You know, what what is this hitchhiker effect? Why are people seeing these fantastic beings that are bipedal uh, werewolves 
for example. Why is that happening? Um, I don't know. I don't have the answers to any of that. I just know from an experiencer standpoint, I do believe there's a consciousness aspect to it. And I believe the government knows there's a consciousness aspect to it. And I would not be surprised if the early uh, projects uh, dealing with, uh, for example, MK Ultra, uh, which was behavior modification or remote viewing, which was the expansion of human consciousness, um, may have involved some kind of like astral like projection mm -hmm. to go to another country and look at what they're working on. That's all high strangeness. You know, it's, it's not like sending a spy plane to take a picture of something. You're sending a human mind over someplace. And how do we learn that? How do we know that that actually could work? Um, I don't know. So I hope these other aspects, particularly the consciousness aspects uh, become talked about because right now experiences are, made to feel like they're freaks, to be honest with you, freaks, that, you know, there's something wrong with you if you have these experiences. Something mentally is wrong with you. And I don't think there's anything mentally wrong with anyone who have these experiences. Back in the old days, they were, we called them prophets. Channelers were called prophets. Uh, they would receive messages from the divine and they would, like, share those messages with the people. Uh, you know, we, we, they revered them as prophets, the people did. And now they're like strange people, you know, they're just freakish people, you know, don't pay attention to them. I think we need to pay attention to channelers and experiencers to help us solve the why question of why they're here. Before we get to the why, let me just take you back a step. I'd love mm -hmm. to know, in your opinion, how well equipped is the US government at keeping tabs on other countries' UFO programs? Because a conversation that happens with me often when I'm at work or speaking to family and friends about UFOs, they'll, they'll ask why it's always America. Why is it always the USA? You know, Roswell and all these different incidents, mm -hmm. always American pilots, American yeah. military. But, it, but it's not. It, it just seems not. to be the US is the kind of mm -hmm. the, the front leader in this. So, for example, if there's a crash retrieval in Russia or China or uh, a Nimitz Princeton tic tac type event mm -hmm. happens with another nation's naval fleet, are the US aware? If we can detect it, we are aware. And when I say by detection, um, that's many means. So one of them is human intelligence. Um, if we recruited someone in the in a foreign government and they have knowledge of this, um, and they're willing to share that with us. That's one me method of finding out what's going on in a foreign country. Secondly, uh, there's technical detection. That is that we have uh, surveillance systems uh, in the sky, aerospace, and in space. Are we able to detect um, a craft entering the sovereign airspace of another country? That's one method of detection as well. So we do employ various methods of gathering intelligence. It's all part of gathering intelligence to determine what's going on in a different country. Now, I would say that perhaps with the Five Eyes, which is your country, the UK, uh, we have Australia, Canada, and New Zealand uh, among the Five Eyes with the United States. Uh, I imagine there might be a little more closer intelligence sharing of actual direct sharing of that intelligence. But I believe the Five Eyes, other Five Eyes countries, are waiting for the U.S. lead to do something. And so when disclosure happens, initial disclosure happens, and the United States government then releases what it has, what knowledge it has, and I, I'm not talking about aero reports. I'm not talking about the annual reports from aero or anything like that. And I'm talking about real disclosure of what's exactly going on, not this bean counting of how many craft did we see this past year. But what has been going on for decades past, when the United States does that, that opens up the door for our Five Eye partners to come forward. And I'm sure Whitehall is sitting on a lot of information other than what was released um, through um, the custody of Nick Pope. He had custody of the UFO files and Whitehall, Whitehall for the U.S. audience is the Pentagon uh, for the U.K., the, the Ministry of Defense. I'm sure they have a lot of information that they're now feel that they can share because they don't nobody wants to go first they're waiting for us to go first so once we go first i hope that other countries will join especially five ice countries that would join and then latin america and africa there, there were events that occurred um the aerial incident in africa for example and i mentioned already uh uh virginia and in, in brazil there are other incidents 
um, with data collected by these foreign governments that they might be more comfortable with releasing once the U.S. takes that first step. I know the UK from, I can speak from a UK point of view, the, the people in charge of whatever UFO data we have are far more successful than the US are at keeping themselves in the shadows and out of the limelight. And they are very much not very well known. So if known yes. at all, um, for, for whatever Nick Pope's role was back in the day in the, the 90s at the MOD, it was more administrative, it certainly seems like. Yes. And he said as much himself, I think, these days. But we don't have a, a Lou Elizondo or a Chris Mellon or an Arrow office or a Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick or a Senator Gillibrand sticking up for the UFO subject. Yes. We just don't have that. And the US is massively taking the lead on that. So that's, that's why that conversation happens. I, I'd love to know, though, do you think, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, uh, you, you mentioned on the Leto Files that there's a range of different systems and radars that keep track mm-hmm. of all sorts of objects in the skies. Mm-hmm. And with the recent shootdowns of the the UAP or balloons or whatever they were in February mm-hmm. over Canada and the US, um, that there were various filters that had to be adjusted so they could be picked up because the radar was only detecting certain objects. Mm. That's mm-hmm. been mm-hmm. reasonably kind of discussed everywhere about. And I just wonder, mm. given the amount of data that the US government and departments within that, stovepipes and others, they must have an incredible amount of real serious, compelling data on true, genuine UFO, UAP incidents. Is it that Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick hasn't seen that data or is he lying about not having seen it? Well, uh, I would say uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick and anyone from the Pentagon side, any from the U.S. government, uh, when we answer questions, we answer the literal question and we do not volunteer any more information than what was asked. So let's go from there. Um, uh, to your previous question, um, in the UK, you have something that we do not have in the United States, and that's the OSA. You know what that is? That's the Official Secrets, Secrets. Act. Yeah. We don't have that. And so in the UK, um, that OSA is primarily uh, what's dampening down this information. So if there is an arrow like office in the UK, you would never hear it. Yeah. And no one's going to say anything about it. But in the US... Uh, once anything gets leaked out, <laughs> it's it's gone. It's it's out there, and in the U.S., we cannot prosecute journalists for leaking classified information. We can prosecute the leaker, but not the means of leakage, because we are protected by the First Amendment, freedom of speech, which protects the press and which protects journalists. Now, to answer the question about uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, uh, he is on the Department of Defense side of the equation, and so there's the Department of Defense. And they have certain authorities under the U.S. Code, the United States Code, Title 10, which uh, is the law that manages and regulates um, the uniform services of the United States. And there's Title 50, which is the civilian side of the intelligence community, mostly CIA. And so he has access to anything in the Department of Defense, anything and everything. He has access to because his boss and his boss's boss can compel access to that information from the department. So his boss is is the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. And uh, that's Mr. Moultrie, who Mm. testified in the earlier hearing. And then uh, Mr. Moultrie's boss is uh, Secretary of Defense Austin. And his boss is the president. So. In the Department of Defense, if they have any information, um, it can't be withheld from Dr. Kirkpatrick. He can compel that because he has the authorities to do so. He also has legislation to do so. Not the same over the Title 50 side, which is CIA. The CIA is not part of the Department of Defense. It's separate from the Department of Defense. And it is an independent intelligence agency. It is answerable to the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, who is answerable to her boss, uh, who is President Joe Biden. So there's that chain as well. So I would say that Dr. Kirkpatrick and his predecessors may have had uh, difficulty. It may have been challenging to get anything out of CIA. There's very little coming out of CIA on this issue other than what CIA is willing to release um, through uh, its FOIA process. And there's also a database where you can look up 
FOIA documents related to UFOs. I understand there's like over 10,000 of them. Uh, John Greenwald has a, a vast majority of them mm. related to UFOs. So there's that. But one thing that people should understand is that just because it's in a CIA archive, does, it, it is not a CIA document. So you get the uh, a misconception is the gateway process paper that was found in the CIA archives, and it says it's a CIA document. It is not. It is a U.S. Army Intelligence and Security Command document that some analysts at CIA wanted to know about and at, had CIA go fetch that document when it was um, written so that it could be placed in the archives for the analysts to use. So a lot of these documents are not originating from CIA, but it does show that some analysts in CIA had an interest in that topic. And so that, that's the value of looking at who's the source of that document. Um, so it, it, Dr. Kirkpatrick said that there's no evidence of extraterrestrials. No credible evidence. No credible. Yeah. What he's basically saying is that based on the data that I collected from Errol, from military observers mostly, that I cannot look at that data and say that's extraterrestrial. And that's a true statement because he showed some of a metallic orb flying across um, the MQ-9 um, predator drone mm -hmm. cameras. And he says, okay, that's a sphere going across. Just looking at that sphere, can you say, okay, that came from another planet? No, you cannot. So who would have that data that says it came from another planet <laughs> or, you know, we saw yeah. it uh, come out of a portal um, and – arrive on earth um, that might be more toward the civilian side on the intelligence community, more under the um, purview of uh, DNI Avril Haines, because she said that we have to also account that they may be coming to us extraterrestrially. She said that in her address at the um, future in space um, one day uh, evening conference that they had in the yeah. national cathedral. If, if we remember that, I think it happened in November of uh, 2021, after the first UAP task force report was released. Yeah. They may be coming to us extraterrestrially. And if you look at the statements made by former directors of CIA and former directors of Central Intelligence, uh, in that role, um, they managed the entire intelligence community before 2005. There was a director of Central Intelligence, which managed the entire intelligence community, and that person also managed the CIA as director of CIA. Before 2005, a lot of these folks are coming forward and saying, well, you know, when I was DCI, director of central intelligence, I had knowledge of this and that and whatever, you know, that there may be a lot more information out there than what we're releasing to you. And that's from the civilian side. You have never heard a secretary of defense make that same statement. Never. It's always on the civilian side of intelligence. And so um, I think disclosure will probably push, be pushed from that side as well, and probably less so from the De Department of Defense side, because they do have equities to protect. And that is whatever we may have exploited from the original technology, the source technology, they don't want that released. Any discussion of legitimate UFOs, UAPs, whatever you want to call them, uh, not from Earth, uh, non-human technology, any discussion of that might lead back to a look into a possibility that we may have exploited that technology for our use. And uh, so they don't want that to happen. So Congress wisely said, okay, Air Force, Navy, whoever, you can keep that technology hidden. We will not ask about that. We just want to know about the non-human stuff. And I think the lead for that will not be arrow but it will be on the civilian side of intelligence in the United States to come forward with that. So you've mentioned the Air Force there, and I know that's something I've heard you recently. It was it was possibly on the Jimmy Church uh, appearance that you put in on Fade to Black. Uh, you mentioned that 
any confirmation of a non-human intelligence making up any number of these encounters would have a big impact on the Air Force. And I think that that's obvious to many. And we automatically assume that would be a negative impact. But I wonder, do you see or can you think of any upside for the Air Force in this eventually coming out? Um, I'm a big Star Trek fan. And um, there was an episode of Star Trek where Mr. Spock said that military secrets are the most fleeting of all. And it was referring to the Romulan cloaking device in that episode, that the Romulan cloaking device is a military secret of the Romulans. And it is, and just in general, military secrets are fleeting. And I think this also refers to what the Pentagon has, because in most instances, um, when there are projects like this, uh, eventually uh, we get to see them in action. So, I'll take the F-117 Nighthawk, um, the, the stealth aircraft that made its debut uh, in the first Gulf War in, in the early 90s, that that aircraft was in development for decades, for decades. Uh, and in fact, I know the CIA physicist who did a lot of the work on that aircraft from the CIA perspective uh, as a weapons intelligence analyst, because he knew uh, exactly what our adversaries had and help model that aircraft based on adversarial capabilities to detect that aircraft. And so that was being worked on for like a decade or more uh, before you even saw it fly. And so, again, with this, people have actually, I believe, seen some of this technology. And whether it's called the TR-3B Black Mantra or whatever the name, Mm. um, I don't know what the name is. But I believe that there's something extraordinary flying in aerospace above the atmosphere, not necessarily in space, but aerospace, with a remarkable proportion technologies and the ability to stay hidden and persistent coverage staying hidden over a target area is the golden nuggets that the uh, Air Force would like to keep secret so that we can fly over an area of interest and monitor what that country is doing persistently. And a satellite, you know, it flies across the sky. We see satellites all the time. And a lot of our satellites that take pictures are in lower Earth orbit. We call it LEO, low Earth orbit. And they're like zipping across the sky, so they don't have a long dwell time over any target. Mm -hmm. And they're busy collecting images on something called a collection deck. So at this time, on this orbit, point your camera here and take a snap, a swath snapshot. And then over here, take another swath snapshot and keep on going. And so you may have like maybe a minute or so over any horizon to horizon area. That's it. From space, you might see a little more, but the point being is that it's orbiting. So once you fly over an area of interest, you're already over another area of interest. Wouldn't it be wonderful just to sit on top of something and just collect, collect, collect. And if it's extraordinary propulsion technology, maybe it doesn't need to be refueled as much. Mm. You know, I mean, maybe that's what they're keeping uh, hidden away. Um, so do, will we ever get that? Maybe if we need to use it in a war, maybe we'll roll it out like we did the F-117. We rolled it out um, uh, for the Gulf War. If if it's serious enough conflict where we needed that, um, we might do it. But once you roll it out, that's it. You know, it's cats out of the bag, as the saying goes. Um, Now the adversaries uh, know what you have. And right now the Air Force does not want any of our adversaries to know what we have. I think there's always that idea that we're we're 20 or 30 years ahead of what we see. And that's why I laughed. I think last year was it China put on, and I think every country does this, but it was a big deal that China's military expo and here's China's latest hardware. And you looked to me and it's clearly not China's latest hardware because they would not be displaying it for everyone to look at if that's what the kind of best of the best. On the civilian side of things though, did you ever have a conversation or ever privy to the idea that Commercial technologies for the members of the general public are getting so much better than they ever were. You know, camera equipment, drone equipment. People have got some very incredible bits of kit just on your everyday, you know, your back garden or a shed. Was there ever the idea that members of the public are going to get better at picking up evidence of a potential 
alien craft or non-human intelligence and what that could mean? Uh, not while I was working at CIA because I left in 2009 and a lot of that technology was nascent. Hmm. So it, it, what we were looking at is um, we were looking at the future of Wi-Fi. Uh, we were looking at the future of cell, cellular technology. And so I remember discussions when 3G was all in vogue hmm. that NSA had some challenges with collecting 3G uh, communications. So that's in the past and now it's 4G and now we have 5G. So, you know, it's the technology in the civilian sector um, always exceeds the ability of the government to collect against that technology. They're always ahead and we're always playing catch up, it seems. Uh, but I think um, that uh, I think we're catching up. You know, there's, there's certain areas that we're finally catching up. One area we're behind is, I think, uh, AI, artificial intelligence. I think there's an awareness of it in the government, but uh, we're reading press reports that, you know, that the government is really taking AI seriously, but it's already been out there. <laughs> so, you know, how do you tackle that? But to your point, yeah, um, technology is always advancing faster than the ability of the intelligence community to catch up with that technology. And that's the challenge. So um, they're always looking at projects to try to predict what would that technology be. And in some areas, there are leaps and bounds uh, advancements. And in other areas, they're still like far behind. Um, but in general, I think that's a true statement, Andy, that, you know, that the civilian technology is advancing. Now, with the um, UAP detection by civilians, if I understand right, and if I go back over uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick's transcripts of his um, testimony before uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee, I did he think he mentioned civilians being incorporated into Arrow, that civilian data should be incorporated into Arrow and that uh, Arrow should be willing to do so. The reason why they don't is because um, government data, the sensor systems uh, flown by the military and the civilian uh, intelligence community, those are what we call instrumented systems. I mean, they're modeled against known signatures. And so we know the response of that sensor system to a known signature. So when you go buy a um, psionics um, Aurora Pro camera, which only operates at 980 nanometers in that IR band, it's very narrow, one channel. Um, it's inadequate really to get the information that we need because what we have make look at many, many, many bands of infrared. It's called hyperspectral, many, many, many bands. So that's what we're flying now, that we can look at something um, and model it because we know the characteristics of the sensor and we can then detect uh, not just one band of IR, but many, many bands to characterize that object in total. That's what Kirkpatrick has access to. Uh, does he want to go just, oh, that's interesting. You have a light in the sky. Um, that doesn't do him any good. Most people, you know what they do when they see a light in the sky that's unusual? It's a natural human um, thing to, you want to zoom in on it and you mm -hmm. want to follow it everywhere you go. You wouldn't believe how much metadata you lose by doing that. Yeah. Because what you want to do is reference it. We need to know exactly where you were, where the camera was pointed, the latitude and longitude of your position, the angle of the camera, the weather conditions, the temperature at various levels and elevation in the atmosphere, everything we need as metadata in order to understand what, what you're seeing. And please don't move the camera because we lose all velocity information. Once you move the camera, the object stays still. If you leave the camera locked on and the object move, is moving against the backdrop, you can at least get an estimate of its velocity. And so that's something that civilians don't understand when they're collecting because they're just looking at the T whiz factor. I got That's something great, cool. great advice for anyone listening yeah. who's going to yeah. be filming something yet. Right. But, you know, I mean, people aren't going to do that. <laughs> you want a really cool video to put on UFO Twitter, you're going to follow that object and you're going to zoom in and out of it. Um, and that just destroys a lot of uh, data that could be used. But having said that, uh, when Kirkpatrick says civilian, I think he's looking at academia. Yeah. Um, for example, like he co-authored a paper with Dr. Avi Loeb. Yeah. 
right? And so that's what he's looking, he's, he's hinting at, that we need to bring in civilian experts in academia um, to look at this problem. Right now, they're being blocked off because they don't have the clearances to look at UAP data, which should not be classified because it's just UAP data. It's something in the sky that we don't understand. Why classify that? Because you're limiting the understanding of it. We want more minds to look at that. And maybe they have a better understanding of what's going on. And I think that's one of the uh, complaints of a lot of civilian scientists is that we're locked out of this. And then the scientists who are cleared, you know, they're just narrowly focusing on a certain project. Oh, I'm just looking at metamaterials. I'm not looking at anything else. Um, that's very limiting, I think. And so part of this disclosure, I hope, is to release that information, all that data, and invite academia into the equation so that we can use better instruments that might far exceed what the government has on the ground looking up. That's why I applaud, you know, having uh, Dr. Gary Nolan involved in this. Hmm. You no, know, he's not a government scientist per se, but he's talked to government people who are government scientists looking at this issue. And so, you know, he's a very valuable resource. Dr. Avi Loeb, is a, uh, Avi Loeb is a very valuable resource, and there might be others out there looking at this um, from that perspective. And we also look have uh, people who are not physicists or scientists or astrophysicists or whatnot. Uh, we also need to bring in sociologists, psychologists. The social science, sciences need to look yeah. at this. We need financial experts to look at this as well, because if there is an admission that it's non-human, what impact would that have on the world economy, on world markets? We don't know. What impact, spiritual people, religious leaders, what impact will it have on human belief systems? We don't know. The government doesn't think like that. They just looks, they're just looking at like hardware. <laughs> they're not looking at what I call, there's hardware, there's software, which is the AI component, and there's wetware, which is us, our brains. Um, that's borrowing, uh, I think, a um, uh, William Gibson term of wetware, uh, that our brains are wetware. That's also important. And we have AI, the software, and hardware, the actual thing that's flying. Everything needs to come together in order to resolve these objects. I'm going to move on to listener questions soon, but I just want to ask you, your, your own language you've used a few times is these things that are visiting and visiting obviously puts in the assumption they're coming from elsewhere. Is that the theory you think best describes what is happening? Obviously, you've had your own experiences to draw on, your own conversations, your own opinion you've formed. A lot of people these days, it's popular to think there's a presence already on this planet that may have you know, succeeded or preceded humans mm -hmm. themselves. What do you think of that? Or is it, is it potentially a culmination of various different things? Well, I broke it down into three three areas I've stated before, and um, I actually shared these, I can say now. I shared them with Jim Simivan, and he liked the way I broke it down. And here's how I broke it down. I said, you know, Jim, there are things about this phenomenon that we don't quite understand that's acting like misbehaving, that we don't understand what they're doing. And when they we have encounters with them, uh, they don't actually turn out to be very good. And I call those the strangers. So they're, they're truly unknown unknowns. Uh, we don't know why that when we encounter them, that people have physiological effects happen to them. They have mental effects happen to them. It's that hitchhiker effect, this skinwalker hitchhiker effect. Mm -hmm. There's been known documented cases of these anomalous health incidents occurring by encountering this phenomenon. Uh, and particularly having orbs come near you and touching you going through bodies. And yeah. then all of a sudden they have these major health uh, issues. So we have that, the stranger aspects. And then we have what I call the visitors, um, actual like beings coming from elsewhere. And they may manifest in flesh and blood like we are. They may be of higher dimension or um, they may be of higher density as uh, the experiencers and channelers would say that you know, they're, not only advanced in technology, but they're advanced in their own being, that they're somewhat um, elevated in their uh, higher consciousness aspects. And I call those the visitors. They may be coming from other star systems or they may be here. 
But then we have the true residents who've been here, as your, uh, uh, to your point, been here a long time. And they've been here longer than we have. And they may have had some uh, influence on how we develop. They may have helped us develop faster than our primate cousins, who are still very much the, they were, the way they were um, when we were like them. And all of a mm. sudden, we had this huge leap that was so huge that uh, anthropologists uh, call it the missing gap. Oh, there's a gap missing. And I'm saying it's not really a gap if we involved in, in that equation um, an intervention that allow us to bridge that gap very rapidly. So there, there they are, the strangers, um, the visitors, and the residents. And that's the way I would break it out. Um, so that's my personal belief. Um, and that works for me. I don't care if it works for anybody else. But, you know, I'm with everyone else. I need to sort it out for myself. You know, like, what is going on? Uh, what is going on with what I experience? Why did I experience that? So in sorting everything out, I built my own theory of everything. It's a personal theory of everything uh, so that I can deal with this phenomenon in a way that um, I would not go into too many rabbit holes that I cannot get out of. Yeah. So that's, that's, what, that's where, where my perspective comes from. And again, if you don't believe that, that's fine. Come up with your own theory of everything, something that works for you. And if you're comfortable with it and you can deal with this phenomenon, in a way that um, won't drag you into these rabbit holes and you get lost forever, then go with that. It doesn't have to agree with mine. Mine doesn't have to agree with yours. Um, but you have something. You have some framework to work to deal with this. You, you've experienced, and I think that's very fair what you've said, um, that it's a very divisive subject. And uh, it's fair to say you are a fan of the subject if i can call it that before you know you mentioned during your time in the cia you attended conferences off your own mm -hmm. dime you weren't sent there as a spy no one was mm -hmm. getting information from you it was very much you wanted to attend so you did mm -hmm. um the way people handle the conversation i think is very important these days with this media spotlight on it as it mm -hmm. is and it's very much at a it's maybe I understand people who have been involved in the UFO topic for 30, 40, 50 years say mm -hmm. they've seen this before. It's come around with Blue Book mm -hmm. and Sign mm -hmm. and Grudge and, and various different conversations have come to a boil and it's gone away. And mm -hmm. we seem to be at a point where it could still go back, but we're, we're mm -hmm. at a point that we could maybe push it that bit further forward. Mm -hmm. A lot of people had an issue with someone you mentioned recently, Anjali, who, who yeah. came on the scene mm -hmm. God, 18 mm -hmm. months ago, it's it's been a funny couple of years. And I'll be honest, personally, I don't agree with how she handled the whole situation mm -hmm. to the point where she came forward with an incredible claim. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know if you have saw how she presented the information. I I Again, did. for me, mm -hmm. definitely not the way to go about any kind of claim like that. And then there was also, again, a social media... And it was a social media tournament where she was putting lists of names up online and asking people oh, yeah. to, vo to mm -hmm. vote who they, they wanted mm -hmm. to see, including yeah. this. I was a part of it, right? Uh, no one mm -hmm. asked, but yeah. okay. And again, the whole presentation of what she was claiming, what happened, how she went about it, in my mm -hmm. opinion, and it seems to be the opinion of many others, was completely wrong. I think recently you, you came out in support of Anjali mm -hmm. in, a, in your comment and what do you see about Anjali and her her presentation of her ideas uh, of mm -hmm. what's credible about that when, as I've tried to put it, that it seemed to be there was a whole lot wrong? And that's not even me saying what she said was, mm -hmm. was or wasn't true, mm -hmm. but the whole presentation of what she said just seemed way off. I, 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 I can say this much, that I've had co private conversations with her, and I'm, I'm sure she won't mind me saying this. Um, but not in the way of criticism of her, but I said, I wish, Anjali, I wish you have would have gone through the Department of Defense process to get your statements cleared by them as at least unclassified. Just do that, because that would have given you some credibility to support your claims that you were an intelligence officer. So I go through a process and CIA, and it's called the Pre-Publication Classification Review Board. A bunch of letters, PCRB, 
So when I came out with, um, I have at least three or four slide decks that I presented to them saying, can I say this? And in all instances, they've come back saying it's unclassified. That's perfect. Then I know what my boundaries are. She did not do that on the Department of Defense side. And uh, I think it's DOPSR, DOPSR, uh, Defense Office of Security Pre-Publication Review, or something to that. Mm. I could have that wrong, but I know the initials are DOPSR, DOPSR. And that's the equivalent process where a Department of Defense employee can submit to this office for review anything they may say in public that might touch on classified subjects. Yeah. And in fact, Dr. James Lakatsky did that exact process prior to the publication of the Skinwalkers at the Pentagon book. It's in the front part of the book that it went through this process. That is, the Department of Defense looked at the book and said, there's nothing in here that's classified, uh, which if you read the book, it's amazing what's not classified. Mm -hmm. um, but she did not go to that, and I wish she would have. Um, though I would say this, that she is who she said she was. That is, she was a member of the intelligence community on the civilian side. Uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency was her parent office. And that um, she had these personal experiences. And if she was just package those experiences in some narrative form and submit it to uh, the Department of Defense and have them look at it and come back saying it's unclassified, that would have gone a long way as to, you know, at least supporting her claim that she was an intelligence officer. Now, we intelligence officers, such as Anjali, myself, and everyone else who you know, um, Lou Elizondo, Jim Simi Van, everybody on the uh, military side and on the civilian side of an intelligence community, we are in databases. And in the Department of Defense side, uh, there's a department, um, the Defense Information uh, Security System or Defense Information System Security. It's DISS. I get the acronyms wrong, but DISS. On the civilian side, that is most CIA officers are in scattered castles. And so if I give a security officer my full name, my social security number, my date of birth, and my place of birth, they can actually go into that database and retrieve verification that I work for CIA and they have the exact dates that I sign all of these NDAs, which when I retired, I had to sign out of them. And the security officer said, my gosh, you have like 24, 26 NDAs. So yep, yeah, I won't have them anymore. And so he put all these NDAs by initials. They're alpha, alphabetic initials, or so sometimes uh, alphanumeric initi uh, initials. And he said, "Here, sign this." And it was like, you know, like six of them on a page, and sign out. And I don't even know what some of them were. Yeah, I forgot what they were. I was right into so much stuff. I, didn't, I had no idea. You no, know, I wonder where that is. Too late now. I already signed out on it, and um, I can't go back and say what was that. Yeah, too late. So you know, that's the process. So. Uh, she is who she said she was, an intelligence officer. Um, and she was an experiencer from childhood. And many of us who are in the intelligence community can say the same thing, that we were experiencers from childhood. I have a friend who was an experiencer from childhood at CIA. And others who are at CIA said, yes, I had these experiences. Jim Simivan was very forthright and uh, uh, very clear about his experiences. He shared his experiences. Um, I shared mine, as you know. Uh, I wish she would have done that. As far as statements I made about um, any interest from the government of Anjali, um, we are going to appear together in a future podcast this month. And so I'm not in control of podcasts. I don't, I don't go out and solicit podcasts. You know, I, like you came to me. I didn't come to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like I, I know you. Came, you came to me before, and I pushed you back, saying, "No, I don't want to do this, Andy." Yeah, <laughs> and, but you know, I thought now is a good time to do it. Um, so with, there will be one with Anjali and myself. It'll be moderated by someone everyone knows um, from Calling All Beings, and that's DJ San Marco. He's going to have what he calls a fireside chat. Sure. I'll be sitting with Anjali and we'll have a conversation. 
and I'm going to bring adult beverages to drink. And we were going to sit there and snack and just talk as if we were at a pub somewhere and we're just sharing a conversation. And I'm going to describe the references or the um, reference I made about Anjali uh, having interest by the government on her case. I will explain that, all of that. And that will happen sometime between now and the end of the month. So stay tuned. And just let me ask, John, because I'll just be blunt. A lot of people don't believe Anjali. And I'm sure mm-hmm. you know that. You're a very intelligent mm-hmm. individual yourself. And I'm sure mm-hmm. Anjali knows that as well. If you didn't believe Anjali yourself, is that something you would be comfortable saying to her? That, And again, this is a, a touchy aspect to this subject, yeah. because that's not to say people are having experiences that potentially yeah. they believe are happening. Mm-hmm. And that's a fine line to walk, I think, in terms of a conversation mm-hmm. in any walk of life. And if, for example, Lou Elizondo had initially came out and said what she said, I don't think Lou Elizondo would still be around in the capacity he is. That's not mm-hmm. to say he knows some incredible things or maybe has had some incredible experiences. Mm-hmm. But, you know, a cake might taste amazing, but if the presentation's bad, no one's going to try it. And I mm-hmm. think the overall presentation to what Anjali's story is mm-hmm. uh, one has been damaging but two I think serves as a bit of a lesson for anyone else coming forward mm-hmm. from and I don't question necessarily Anjali's background but just the way she went about it and mm-hmm. I think it, there's got to be a different way and a better way to do that because right, of yeah. the substance of what she mm-hmm. was saying right and and um, she knows this I, I've said I wish she didn't use the, Wash, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington D.C. Mm-hmm as a place because it was very noisy, very windy. Um, I couldn't hardly hear her. And I would say that um, there was a conference called Making Contact uh, back then. And she just appeared as a guest Mm -hmm. speaker, surprise speaker on this Making Contact conference that occurred online back in 2021. And so there she was and she made these these claims without any prefacing of who she was. Um, like my first, um, actually my first appearance was in private. It was for the ICER executive committee. Mm-hmm. It's the international coalition of extraterrestrial research. I appeared with them privately. They had my slides. I sent them my slides through one of the members from Peru. Uh, my good friend, Giorgio, who represents Peru in ICER, um, you know, they see my slides. And so I appeared with them. And so also um, I appeared with Whitley Strieber and I gave Whitley Strieber my entire CIA resume that's unclassified and also my slides. And so that's how I came out. And, um, you know, Jim Semivan and Lou Elizondo knew of me before I came out. They knew I was going to come out. Um, That's how it happened. And, of course, I had the backing of CIA, not to say what I said was true, but you're not saying anything that's un- uh, that's classified. Yeah. But she didn't do that. And I wish she would have done that in a different venue. I think it would have, the outcome would have been different. Um, and also, the worst place to come out is in social media. Absolutely. That's not yeah. where you want to come out. You know, you want to come out in a podcast. And although, you know, your podcast is, becomes part of social media, you know, it is a podcast that you have done mm-hmm. and you've talked to and interview people. And there's some kind of vetting going on when you appear in a podcast. People ask you questions like you're asking me, challenging my my uh, opinions, which is all good. And bringing up skepticism, which is all good. Um, I welcome that. And again, you know, no one has to believe me and no one has to believe Anjali. But the way she did it, um, it was like a fire hose event. Mm. more than this measured kind of introduction to the UFO community. It was just too much at one time. And I think that may have hurt her a little bit. But having said that, um, I do believe in her experiences. They seem consistent with experiences of others as well. Um, So I'll leave it at that. But as far as, you know, uh, as far as um, government interest in what she had to say, um, I will look for. I look forward to explaining all of that uh, on that uh, podcast with DJ San Marco. This fireside chat he wants to have. 
Yeah, I know DJ well and the, the other folks mm-hmm. of Calling All Being. So I look forward to that and I'll always yeah. share their stuff in that as well. So, uh, and I appreciate the answer as well, John. And that's something a lot of people wanted brought up and I was interested mm-hmm. in too. So um, a lot of people did want to hear from me. If you don't mind, I'll ask just a couple of questions to finish mm-hmm. off. I'll cut them down. Um, question from Peter. He asks, what is the single greatest reason for US security, military and government services to have concealed what they know of UFO activities for the past 70 or 80 years? And I think you've touched on this but just to right, yeah. summarize it. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I would think it's it's the military exploitation of an advanced technology that at that time they didn't understand. Um, and they were able to derive some technology adapted for human use, that is, for use by humans. Um, they, I don't believe they reproduced the vehicle. You hear of ARV or alien reproduction vehicle. That implies that they were able to recreate, reproduce the materials um, which was found in the construction of the vehicle. I don't believe we can do that hmm. um, because it's been already stated uh, that the materials uh, are, although the elements are known on earth, um, the purity of the materials um, is difficult to achieve on this planet. It's almost like off world. Um, so I'll say that much. And I'm not a metallurgist. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a physicist. And I'm a political scientist who lucked out and got a job that required an engineering degree at CIA. And I was able to like rise up in the ranks. Yeah. So I don't claim to know what uh, Dr. Eric W. Davis knows or Dr. Hal Putoff or even Dr. Ron Pandolfi or any of the other uh, Dr. Jack Safardi. Um, these are like science, real scientists. Um, and I don't know what they know, but I would say this, that, you know, it's probably the exploitation of that technology that they're hiding um, because, you know, if it comes from out of space, I mean, why hide it? Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, meteorites fall from out of space. Why hide that? That's not secret. You know, so here comes something that's flying and it hits the earth and crashes. Why hide it? It could be because there are beings on it that we recovered and they didn't understand the beings. But even the, then, um, wouldn't, wouldn't you want, like, scientists to examine these beings? Oh, my gosh, look. Um they're beings from outer space. Is that a national security secret? I don't think so. I don't think that's a national security secret at all. But I do think that if they were able to make something fly, really cool, um, almost like it, but not quite, um, they would want to keep that secret. And I think that's that's where the classification uh, comes in. And also, we were not aware back then if the Russians had something similar. Um, there may have been some in the back of um, the military's mind that, um, you know, we, we're we going to exploit this and we want to hide the exploitation from our adversaries. Yeah. A uh, question from Gary. He asks, can you ask John if he can comment on the possibility of evidence, evidence of artificial structures on the moon, Mars or elsewhere in our solar system? Uh, I think famously Buzz Aldrin on UK television commented on monoliths on the moon. And when people saw them, they would ask who put them there. I would say this, that the, uh, we talked about the military intelligence community and the civilian intelligence community. Um, I neglected to add NASA. I believe NASA is sitting on a lot of data that they've kept hidden, that they kept hidden. And I would hope that NASA becomes part of this initial disclosure process when it happens, because they need to come forward And I've stated before, and I believe even on uh, an earlier podcast with you, Andy, that um, looking at the James Webb Space Telescope, so don't be surprised if they use James Webb Space Telescope Hmm. or NASA Exploration as the um, discovery. You know, that, that is to say that the military intelligence and civilian intelligence communities in the United States already knew something was there, but they can't admit it. But they'll let NASA discover it, and then that discovery would then spur more interest in that, more research, um, and might then uh, also stimulate exploration of that. So if there are like structures on the moon that we know about, um, it might be discovered by the first Artemis crew, or uh, they're going to be orbiting the Earth. Uh, I'm sorry, they're going to be orbiting the moon. They're not Mm going to land. They're going to orbit first and then come back. And the second Artemis crew is supposed to land on the moon. And then the 
the third Artemis crew is supposed to land on the poles, South Pole. That's what I hear. So will they discover something? Maybe. Um, you, we keep hearing rumors that have not been substantiated, but nevertheless rumors that NASA has data, that they've seen things that they've airbrushed out of the original mm -hmm. photos. And that's what they released to the public. That could be true. I mean, that could very well be true. And I, I'm hoping that that data will be released. Because once we say that there are non-human beings involved with what's flying, uh, they may be able to say that as they being NASA, oh, we also know that there are non-human beings uh, that had a presence on the moon or the nearby planets. Yeah. You know, that opens up that. But first, we've got to do this non-human statement first from, from the U.S. government. That has to absolutely come first. Non-human is the most important phrase that you'll hear, that we validated and verify that there is, non, there is a non-human presence um, on the planet, uh, in the planet, underneath the oceans, or flying in the skies of Earth. And then we can go to the moon and to Mars or wherever else where there might be other, other types of um, structures. Um, and while I was at CIA, uh, I did have access um, to some original uh, uncompressed files um, that I was able to access uh, through my CIA workstation uh, it was processed by Malin Space Systems, I, I believe, which had a contract with NASA. I looked at one of the moons of Mars, and that's where I saw the uh, what we would call an, an uh, obelisk. It's very much like an Egyptian structure. Now, what I see now seems very low resolution than what I saw. What I saw was a structure. I said, my gosh, look at this. And I had some of my colleagues look over it. It looks like the Washington Monument. And here it is on, on this, uh, I think it was Phobos. Here it is, you know. And then later, all that data disappeared. You don't get those swaths anymore where you can actually look at high-resolution data. And the resolution of the data is extremely high. What I saw, what you see now is like copies of copies of copies. I don't know what happened to it. Can so I ask then? Because mm -hmm. from, from an ignorant point of view, and I don't know the chain of command at NASA and the way mm -hmm. someone like yourself may, um, I know Bill Nelson's administrator, and he mm -hmm. has a bit of a champion of the UFO subject. He was briefed oh, yeah. on UAPs when he was mm -hmm. in government, um, very much talks on the edge of extraterrestrial life, oh, and yeah. are we alone? Probably not. It's, he's great to listen to. Yeah. NASA is an organization. It's not a person. So if Bill Nelson is at chief of NASA, head of NASA right now, and that information is at NASA, quote unquote, mm -hmm. can't Bill Nelson just get that information? Or are we talking that are individuals in the background or previously in charge at NASA who don't allow that information just to be seen by anyone? Uh, I would say this, that um, the administrator of NASA has access to everything um, NASA has in its archives, current and past. And there's no like compartmentation within NASA. It, it is truly a civilian organization. Um, and having said that, the Bill Nelson um, was a member of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence when he was a senator. He was also mm. a congressman uh, from Florida as well. And he's been briefed on this throughout. Yeah. So he has a lot of knowledge. And now he has the go ahead um, to be more forthcoming. Uh, because I believe he understands that when the civilian military and civilian side of intelligence come forward, that they're non-humans flying, the obvious, obvious place to go next is NASA, because there should be nothing classified at NASA. Absolutely nothing in NASA should be classified. And if it is classified at NASA, I would be very interested in that data, because it's civilian science. Why classify it um, unless NASA was compelled to classify it from the intelligence community saying you can't release this? That could be it. But once the civilian intelligence community, military intelligence community come forward, then there's no reason for NASA to classify anything. And they start, should start sharing what it has and also release their astronauts from whatever agreement they had with NASA to talk, start talking about what they've seen. I'm sure they've seen a lot. And uh, so we'll see where that leads. But I think NASA, um, 
thank you for bringing up NASA. I forgot to mention, NASA is a really important part of this. It's a hard conversation to have with anyone, John, without forgetting something. I think everyone does at some point and someone mm-hmm. gets angry and messages me, so you'll get that as well, no doubt. Um, yeah. Jennifer wanted to know, are you encouraged or discouraged at all by the CIA to give these online interviews for, on podcasts or presentations, etc.? They absolutely have no qualms whatsoever. The only time I heard about anything I said that CIA people questioned um, was my comment about 2027. So I did receive some feedback um, that there were some CIA people um, interested in what I said about 2027. But again, I've said before, I did not bring up 2027. Uh, There were people in a skiff, and I don't have any clearances. So in that skiff, we can talk about sensitive subjects, but I couldn't talk. I didn't have any clearances. So I could talk about things I remember from my time in service about this phenomenon, which I did. But uh, in the skiff, the people in the skiff who invited me to talk with them in that skiff mentioned they brought up 2027. I did not. So that led me to believe that they knew something about 2027. And I offered my opinion about 2027, uh, actually deferring back to Chris Bledsoe and what he said about the 2026, 2027 period. I also mentioned Anjali, what she said about that time period, which they duly noted, and they just took notes. Mm -hmm. That gives you a clue that, you know, maybe what she said um, is is somewhat known to them um, about these experiences. I I think the government knows more about experiences than they are willing to let let on because it brings up another whole avenue that they don't want to go to. But, you know. They brought it up. So that's the only time that when I mentioned in a podcast with, um, I forget who I did it with, but I mentioned in a podcast, 2027, uh, that I heard some feedback from CIA people about 2027. I want to ask, do you think, and this is just opinion, unless it comes from that informed place, that any sort of date that's put on something in terms of ET contact or some kind of confirmation is very much led on our end. And by our end, I mean the human end, because I can't imagine a non-human species has an iPhone with the same calendar and thinks that, you know what, right now, as we sit here, we're going to wait two years, two Earth years, and come out on this date and time, because I don't think they would look at time and calendars how we do. So Mm. anytime a date is put on something, it's got to be something that's led from our side. Right, unless they're the residents, unless they're here on the planet as well. We share the planet with them. And, and they would case, also have to be aware of our way of measuring time and dates. Yes, and- they would. And, and in fact, you know, you go back to, I encourage everyone to study Sumerian culture hmm. because uh, they had some remarkable mathematics back then. Um, with very, with ostensibly no computers, they figured out a lot of stuff about the planet and about the solar system that they should not have known. But having said that, um, yes, I mean, disclosure from the government is human or governments of the world. It's something that we know that we can share with the world. Their appearance to us is on their timetable. So I would hope, you know, that, when we disclose that they're here, that they will disclose who, who they are. So that was my personal opinion, not a government fact, nothing I know officially, that in 2027, once we disclose everything by 2027, I hope there's an opportunity for these visitors and for these residents to come forward and show themselves again, I say again, to the world. Because I think they've done that previously to the ancients who saw them as gods, who may have worshipped them as gods, mm. who created religions based around their presence. Um, there's an opportunity for them to show up. And so why are they sh- 
pick 2027? I don't know. Why did we pick 2027? I don't know. I got that clue from Lou Elizondo when in 2022, he said that in five years, it will all be out. So at simple math, you had five years to 2022 when he said that in a uh, in his interview. I came up with 2027. I said, well, Lou knows something about 2027 because he said in five years, it'll all come was, out. Was that the comment of, and I'm just trying to be fair, where he said, in five, if people aren't interested in what's happening now, come back in five years, go and do something and come back. and Yeah, to pick a have, hobby. Yeah, yes. yeah, and come back. And people have yeah. read into that. Um, hopefully Lou's on the media rounds again by late. 2023 which would be interesting because he's been away for a while and uh, mm-hmm. it'd be nice to pick his brain on a few things but yeah no that that's fair listen last couple of questions and then we'll let you get on with your day john so now you've got a, a busy life um question from newman he asks do you su- do you subscribe to the claims of people like robert monroe who say the earth is a farm used by higher beings to harvest lower vibrational energies or by ets to harvest souls i have no idea uh, i i don't have any comment about that at all um, harvesting souls, how does one do that? Why would one do that? Um, to me, a soul is something that can't be harvested. It's like a consciousness that can't be harvested. I mean, are they hijacking consciousness? I, I find that hard to believe. And based on my personal experiences, um, I don't think that's true. I think we're here on a mission. Uh, I think experiencers um, had this universal kind of feeling, uh, maybe not so universal. I don't want to put words in people's mouths. But there's always a sense of mission that I had this experience and now I have to do something with it. That, you know, I, I'm compelled to do something with it. And some people do. And others are kind of stymied because they're trying to sort out in their minds this experience. To some, it's very frightening. For me, I would think I was prepared for it because I've had these experiences since childhood. And it seems like I was brought along gradually, Mm -hmm. um, and somehow ended up at CIA working in the two offices that had the legacy UFO program since Roswell. I was in those two offices. And so why did that happen? You know, why, why did I end up at CIA from my walk of life? And you look at other officers at CIA, people I know, you look at their past and you kind of wonder, how did they end up there? But one thing that uh, I had in common with one of my very close friends is that he had missing time. He was he was like um, a youngster, like five or six years old, something like that. And he went out in his backyard and he saw a strange light. There was some a forest in behind his house, some trees. And he went out there and then he had a memory of coming back in a house and his parents were angry at him because he was missing for hours. And so... He had this experience he cannot remember, and um, he's been a lifelong experiencer since. He he saw a lady in white before Chris Bledsoe. Uh, he told me, I saw this lady in white, uh, and it was like in the early 2000s, he was saying that. And I, I personally found it hard to believe because I never had the lady in white experience, but mm. he did. And he said, she had a, he, she had a message for me. And uh, so... There you go. You know, we we tend to have these experiences that are hard to explain. We end up where we are. And I felt like it was my mission. I was told it was my mission when I had my most recent orb experience in July of 2020 that I was supposed to come forward with the information I have because it was time to share information about them and information I know from my my work. And that's why I started to come out forward. And that's why I'm speaking with you. Otherwise, you would have never heard about me whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and I would be happy to do so. And I'm happy that people will forget me after disclosure because I think my job is done. Um, what I know, uh, what I've experienced, it's already out there. Take it or leave it. I don't, I don't really care if people believe me or not. But I hope I contributed something to people's understanding. Um of what's going on and particularly helping people understand their own experiences. I've have worked with individuals privately about understanding their experiences. And that's what I enjoy doing the most less. So I don't care how they fly to get here. I just know they're here and why are they here? And that's what I like people to, you know, understand. And so anything I can share, um, I'm happy to work with them and 
maybe that's what I'll do. But um, after May this month, at the end of the month, um, I think you know uh, Hollywood yep. as well. And I will have my last, very last interview prior to disclosure with her. After that, I am not doing any more interviews. And we set up uh, the last Sunday in May. So look in your calendars. The last Sunday in May would be my very last interview with anyone until disclosure. And then after disclosure, I promise one individual I'll do a post-disclosure interview. And that's Jay Anderson, Project Unity. I'll do one more. And then I hope to disappear. I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Because I think from there, civilians should take up the mantle and get their governments to disclose more information. You know, it's up to the civilians to then pressure your members of parliament or your congressmen, pressure them to release more information. Because I think at disclosure, the government's pretty much saying everything it can say. And then from there, it's a process of having civilians involved, civilian scientists, enthusiasts such as yourself, myself, you know, Let's let's work on this from the uh, legislative side. Let's let's get these governments to even like tell us even more uh, beyond their non-humans. So, thank well, you very I, much. <laughs> I was going to say I think that's a lovely place to leave that, John. And I always like to say I'd love to have you back on. Never say never. We never know what's going to happen in the near future. But I appreciate you've done a lot of these and you've given a lot of people your time. And it's for free. I've never paid a guest uh, for coming on the podcast. And you do volunteer your time. And you you do when the microphone goes off and you switch off the camera. You're off to to make a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, go to the shops, and, and live your well, life like the rest. Something of stronger, Andy. Stronger, <laughs> John. Actually, that's a bad uh, habit because I'm sure last time or the first time you had happy hour you were going to with your wife so if it, if it's happy hour again then more power to you <laughs> but listen john great speaking yeah. with you and thank you uh, Andy. uh like i say if we have you back on it'd be wonderful if not thank you very much for your time and i can assure you from the comments on this podcast and others you certainly have an impact in people's lives and conversations when it comes to the ufo topic so thank you for that uh you're very welcome and thank you that is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, UAP, AM. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. Meditative game of fateful on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. Myself, and I climbed out the window after the elf, and I woke up in my bed, and there was something on my head, and everything was weird, and everything was red. And I helped out my boys, they thought this was noise, they thought it was a dream, they thought it was my toys, they thought it was my problems, and they think I should seek therapy, and I don't know what it is, because it doesn't really scare me. Consider your lies, consider your life, consider your eyes.